Yeah, I chose to, to title my presentation Energy Tuned XPS used to study battery in spaces uh, because we're not only using HackSpace, although that's an important technique, but we're using XPS over a whole wide uh, range of energies, uh, photon energies, in fact. Uh, so a little about myself uh, briefly. Uh, I'm a researcher and docent at uh, the Department of Chemistry, Ångström, at uh, Ångström Laboratory in Uppsala, Sweden. And uh, also part of this uh, competence center, the Advanced, uh, Ångström Advanced Battery Center, or BC, that we have uh, in Uppsala University. I'll say a bit more about that later. Uh, a little about, about my background. I'm from Reading in the UK. I moved to Sweden about uh, eight years ago. Uh, after having done a uh, postdoc in uh, St. Andrews in Oxford with Peter Bruce. Uh, maybe you know him uh, as a uh, battery researcher as well. So, uh, yes, so then with this presentation, I would like to firstly give you a very brief overview about uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, a bit about interfaces that we find inside batteries, how we can use HackSpace and uh, related techniques to study battery interfaces and uh, some of the challenges that we face when doing so. And then finally, a few examples of the research that we're doing uh, at Uppsala uh, in relation to this. So many of you will know, of course, how a lithium ion battery works, uh, but just for those who don't, a very brief uh, introduction. So a lithium ion battery is an electrochemical energy storage device. It stores energy chemically and converts to electrical energy during operation. Uh, so it's uh, really useful, as you know, for portable electronic devices, electric vehicles, and also grid storage. Uh, and you can see a schematic here on the right side of a lithium-ion battery. It's made of lots of different materials, but you essentially have two different uh, electrodes here, the anode and cathode, uh, each with some sort of electroactive uh, material. So in the anode case, it's usually graphite, and in the cathode case, then we have uh, often a transition metal oxide. Uh, and then these materials are usually mixed together with some polymeric binder, uh, some conductive additive as well. And then you have various other parts of the battery, for example, the separator, which is in the middle to, to separate the two electrodes. Uh, and this also holds the liquid electrolyte, which is uh, transporting lithium ions back and forth between the two electrodes. So, yes. Uh, that's a very simplified view of the lithium ion battery. Here is a slightly more complex view, uh, which focuses on really what the interfaces uh, that we have inside the battery are. And uh, so on the left side, again, we have the anode. Uh, and I would say uh, one of the most important sort of interfaces is then between the anode and the liquid electrolyte. Uh, and what happens is when we are experiencing very reducing potentials at the anode, we form what's known as the SEI, and that's uh, the solid electrolyte interface. This is a, uh, a collection of products from electrolyte decomposition, essentially, which form a, a solid layer on the active material, the carbon anode. And this uh, essentially acts to passivate the, the anode, um, and lithium ions can still move back and forth between the active material and the electrolyte. Uh, you have something similar forming also on the cathode, here at higher potentials, uh, some surface film, which we often refer to as the cathode electrolyte interface. And um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, reactions and mechanisms that can, can occur uh, towards aging of batteries as well. Uh, one of which, for example, is SCI decomposition. Uh, so that's where you may have uh, some breakup or dissolution of the SCI back into the electrolyte. So then you, you might, <coughs> then you might have uh, yeah, uh, some aging mechanism because of this. Uh, on the cathode side, then you might have some transition metal uh, dissolution, uh, which then leads to a capacity fading of, of the battery uh, or some structural disordering, uh, which again then limits the amount of lithium that you can store potentially inside the cathode material. So there's a lot going on, a lot of different materials, a lot of interfaces between the different uh, components of, of, the, of the battery. And we want to build better batteries. So what we do really in our battery research is to try to understand, for example, how charge is compensated in electrode materials. Uh, so uh, that can then uh, give us uh, capacity and voltage, which are uh, things we want to maximize in the battery. But it can also lead to uh, phase transformation, as I mentioned already. 
uh, dissolution of the material in the cathode, uh, for example. So we want to know a bit more about uh, those kind of uh, mechanisms. Uh, and then on the anode side, uh, with the solid electrolyte interface, the SEI, we want to know, for example, its composition, its thickness, uh, other sort of mechanical properties, for example, ionic conductivity, uh, its stability uh, against dissolution, for example, uh, and how maybe electrolyte additives can actually go on to form uh, more stable SEI layers. So these are all things that we want to that we want to know to to actually build a better battery. Um, and this is especially important when we're then developing new materials uh, for the electrode and the electrolyte. Uh, and you see a little schematic on the right side, actually, um, how complex the SEI is. Um, so we're forming, you know, many different types of materials here. Um, uh, there's lithium oxide, lithium fluoride, uh, polymeric uh, materials. So it's very complex. And then I think this is a good point to, to mention a bit more broadly what we do uh, in Uppsala at the Onstrom Advanced Battery Center. So we're more than 100 scientists from chemistry, physics, and engineering sciences. Uh, so we're quite multidisciplinary uh, and an international environment. Uh, we develop commercial lithium-ion battery technologies, uh, next generation lithium-ion uh, using new materials, and, uh, and then also beyond lithium-ion batteries. So this can include, for example, sodium-ion batteries, uh, among others. And as I mentioned, we're looking at all different uh, components of the battery. So the anode, the cathode, the electrolyte, these interfaces between the components and looking at also new concepts for batteries. And then this includes uh, synthesis of new materials, uh, developing new characterization methods. So we're looking uh, a lot at neutron diffraction, operando X-ray diffraction, and uh, various types of XPS, uh, including in situ XPS. We like to look at the fundamental processes, processes that are occurring inside the battery, uh, because we're scientists, we're academics, we like to see what's happening on the small scale, which influence then the lifetime and uh, energy and power of these larger sort of parameters of a battery. Uh, and then we are working a lot with industry to develop uh, kind of, yeah, um, uh, commercial sort of uh, lithium ion batteries, which can be used for EVs and, and the grid. So then to, uh, to look at a lot of those things that I already mentioned to do with interfaces, uh, we can use uh, XPS, which we've already had an introduction to this morning. And uh, so as you know, it's very surface sensitive, sensitive uh, chemically sensitive. Uh, and then this is uh, what makes it suitable to actually study these uh, very thin interfacial regions of the different materials inside the battery. We can use uh, synchrotron radiation, uh, and that's what this uh, tuning of the photon energy is about, uh, to try and vary the probing depth. Uh, so sometimes we call this HAXPES, or even SOXPES, so soft uh, XPS, soft X-ray XPS, yeah. Uh, uh, this gives that information about the SCR composition and the structure, which is what we're looking for. So we try to understand then how the electrolyte decomposed to form this uh, surface layer, uh, how those products were, were uh, formed. And then uh, we can also even look at the bulk electrode material properties. So if we're using HAXPES, we can actually probe right through the surface layer uh, and even see the electroactive material underneath. And this can give us some hints about redox activity of the, of the active material. Uh, and maybe there's some aging, me aging mechanisms there uh, which are relevant. Um, yeah, typically we're, well, and historically then, then we're looking um, ex situ at samples from the batteries uh, under ultra high vacuum. Uh, but we can also then use uh, ambient pressure XPS uh, to do in situ and operando uh, liquid or solid state uh, battery studies. So that's uh, an area which is getting really interesting now. But uh, yes. Um, I think, yeah, we, we can actually claim that we, our group was the first to use synchrotron XPS. Uh, so we heard about the Uppsala history uh, from Alex this morning, uh, but our group in Uppsala working with batteries was also the first to use synchrotron mm -hmm. XPS to study uh, these kind of materials. So this was done then at the, the old uh, Swedish synchrotron MAX-2. 
Uh, and you can see here on the right side, uh, this is the carbon 1S spectra for cycle graphite from a battery uh, deintercalated and lithium intercalated uh, samples using quite low uh, photon energies there. Um, so you would not uh, call this Hatsbis according to the definition that we heard this morning. Uh, but still, it's an interesting use of, uh, of the technique. And it has developed uh, ever since from that. And nowadays, we can use uh, several synchrotron uh, beam lines for doing uh, energy tuned XPS. So, uh, for example, uh, people in my group are often using IO9, a diamond light source here, uh, and P22 at DAISY, uh, both uh, uh, possible to do HACSPES uh, at IO9. And you can also uh, use the soft X-ray uh, branch of the beam line as well. So with synchrotron radiation, then, like I said, we're able to cover this wide range of photon energy, uh, photon energies, uh, to probe a very quite wide region of uh, of the surface and down to the what you could consider the bulk as well, 50 nanometers in some cases. Uh, I would say if you're interested in reading a bit more deep in terms of uh, looking at interfacial reactions in rechargeable batteries um, by XPS, then you can look at our uh, review from two years ago. Uh, but then I will move on and talk about some of the challenges that we experience um, when trying to study uh, battery materials using XPS. And I think many of these also come from the talk uh, this morning. Um, but uh, I think battery materials are uh, a, a quite, yeah, potentially a unique case uh, where we have very highly reactive materials. Uh, uh, compounds, uh, for example, containing lithium or sodium, even if we're not uh, working so much with the actual lithium or sodium metals, uh, we still um, experience uh, some reactivity, some moisture or, uh, or gases in, in the air. And this then uh, creates challenges, for example, uh, to transfer a sample from a battery into the spectrometer. Um, so we have to think about this quite a lot. We're using glove boxes and some sample transfer chambers, uh, typically. But then what if you want to go to the synchrotron? Uh, you know, you have to prepare your sample several days before you even start to measure. How do you ship the samples? How do you store them? Uh, in what sort of atmosphere? Uh, so this is, yeah, still sort of ongoing questions in, in the field, how you, how you do this. The, set, the, the next point then is um, washing of samples. So, Typically, we want to actually remove some of the excess electrolyte from the surface of the sample. Otherwise, the salt will actually crystallize out on the surface and potentially block some of the signal of the SEI or the, the material they're trying to, to study. So this is a yeah, tricky question as well, whether or how to wash and, and whether to even wash uh, and to what extent. So uh, that's, that's still a, a sort of open discussion point in, in the community. Um, then we have uh, these composite electrodes, which I described earlier, which are made of lots of different materials, conductive materials, semiconductors, insulating species, for example, the polymer binder. And then we have to think about uh, charging and charge compensation. Okay, uh, then a lot of the materials that we're looking at are uh, quite sensitive to X-ray radiation. So uh, particularly the SCI species, polymer components, if we're looking at, for example, some new polymer electrolyte material, then this is quite challenging. Or uh, if we're studying lithium metal as a potential anode material. Uh, so then we have to think about this, you know, depending, depending on what instrument we're, we're using to study the materials, uh, whether we can limit the, the flux of the, the photons um, somehow, or yeah, uh, sometimes we have to move to different spots uh, every now and then to, to limit the, the amount of damage that's caused. Uh, and then finally, uh, data analysis. So, of course, we have many different elements and species inside these electrodes and in the electrolyte or the SCI, then, uh, then it's very difficult to actually process this data and to, to come up with some clear uh, outcomes. Um, and that, and then, then the reaction mechanisms are not always really, really clear what's happening inside the battery. Uh, in which case we can also turn to model systems. Uh, so we can remove, for example, the binder, some of the additives and so on, uh, to have a more clear picture of what, what we're doing. Uh, so at, at Uppsala, in our battery group, then we have a couple of instruments, uh, a very old 55500, 
And then this newer uh, Crazos uh, Axis Super Plus that we, we have uh, for a few years now. And this one uh, is nice because we have the dual anode, uh, the aluminium and the silver uh, dual anode, which is monochromated. Uh, and um, yeah, I was not considering that this was Haxbest earlier, but uh, with the almost 3000 EV, then uh, I think we can call this uh, a partially Haxbest instrument. Uh, but anyway, it's also got this uh, gas cluster ion source, which is interesting for uh, uh, Spatzer depth profiling of uh, more sensitive materials such as polymers, uh, somewhat inorganic materials without sort of chemically damaging the material. And uh, it's quite nice for doing high throughput uh, measurements, quite automated. Uh, we have a lot of users using this instrument, so that was important for us. Uh, and you can see, oh, you can see these are the sample uh, transfer. Uh, holders that we use for our battery samples. So we, we close this up in the in the Argon glove box, transfer it directly into the uh, load lock. And then at Uppsala, we've also just in recent years had this uh, Hexpus lab uh, installed. Uh, and we have a few people, uh, well, one or two, working on batteries uh, with this system as well. So as you know, this has uh, gallium uh, uh, sourced at just over 9 kV. Uh, and uh, this allows us, or Hexpress in general, allows us then to access uh, uh, core levels, deeper core levels, as was mentioned earlier, uh, such as silicon 1S. And silicon is quite important uh, in terms of battery science uh, because it's one of the materials which is a sort of next generation anode material. It's already used to some extent, to a very small extent, in fact, uh, in, in current lithium ion battery anodes. So this kind of silicon graphite composites. Uh, and, uh, but then it's interesting to find out, for example, lithiation mechanisms for silicon and graphite, uh, or how the SCI forms on each of these materials. And here you just see some, some SEM and some EDX uh, maps uh, for a silicon graphite composite electrode um, yeah, with, the, with the brighter areas in, uh, in the SEM, uh, there are silicon. Uh, but we've already shown in some uh, studies that you know you form different SEI compositions on uh, and properties on on these different materials. So it's interesting to actually uh, then use Hexpress uh, to start to study uh, those as well. And then on the right side, then you, you see um, some silicon electrode as you as you cycle it, uh, as you insert lithium in and remove the lithium, so you have some change in intensity for the silicon peaks and some uh, shifting as well as you insert lithium. Uh, then on the cathode side, as I mentioned, we're looking at transition metal oxides uh, and therefore looking at some, uh, some samples related to those, for example, nickel oxide here, uh, as is shown, can be interesting. So we're looking uh, with the aluminium and the, the gallium sources here to have some surface versus bulk analysis of nickel oxide sample. And you can see in the oxygen spectra, uh, then we have um, some uh, lowering of the um, of the surface oxide species, and in the uh, carbon, then you can see that actually we uh, we have a much lower intensity for the for the carbon uh, contamination at the surface, whereas in the nickel uh, we see some change in the peak, in the peak shape, uh, which is really useful at, then as as a sort of reference when we when we look at a real battery cathode material. Yeah, so that, that's uh, what have we done so far with the, with the Hackspace lab. Uh, but now I'll just give you a couple of examples of what we have been doing in general over the last few years with Hackspace. Uh, and most of this data is then from IO9 at Diamond. Uh, so uh, firstly, we've been looking at oxygen redox active cathode materials. So when you have oxygen, uh, which is active, um, uh, a redox active uh, element inside the, the cathode material, then you get a boost in the capacity. So this is why it's interesting to study these. Um, and then we found uh, a concentration gradient for oxygen redox activity. Uh, so it's, it's happening more at the surface than, than in the bulk. And then if we look at, uh, on the right side, you see some uh, nickel 2P spectra uh, at different uh, photon energies. And we, we also see some, um, yeah, some interesting activity here uh, for the nickel, which is meant to be redox active as well. Uh, so it gets oxidized when you, when you charge the battery. Um, so that's yeah, 
demonstrating a little bit how we can study these these kind of cathode materials, uh, looking at the the redox um, mechanisms as well. Um, then the second material is the high capacity cathode, uh, which is this lith uh, lithium rich oxychloride. It's a vanadium oxychloride. Uh, and this material is uh, not uh, by any means close to commercialization. It's very interesting from a research point of view, uh, but it's uh, one that has quite a strong reaction between the electrode material and the uh, liquid electrolyte, uh, perhaps involving oxygen oxidation. Uh, and this leads to actually a, a quite rapid capacity fade you see in the blue line here uh, for that material. Um, and we found using Hacksbest then that the, the degradation begins at the surface. So we were able to follow the, uh, the redox activity of the vanadium using Hacksbest. And we see that this, uh, this is starting to become inactive more at the surface in the beginning and then moves in towards the bulk as you continue cycling it. Uh, one uh, strategy then to stabilize this material against the electrolyte is to coat the material. Uh, so we can use an aluminium trifluoride surface uh, coating, uh, as you see here. And uh, then this limits the, uh, the reduction of the solvents inside the electrolyte. Uh, we still see some uh, reaction of the, uh, this is the LIPF6, it's the salt inside the electrolyte. Um, but it, overall, it gives a much more stable cycling behavior, as you see uh, here for these red and green lines. Um, yeah, I know I'm not going to look. I'm not go, not going to go through all of these uh, axis spectra here, but but uh, this is essentially showing that we have quite a stable surface as we're going up to 50 cycles uh, with quite little electrolyte decomposition uh, at the cathode material there. So uh, then the final example is uh, from sodium ion batteries, uh, which are uh, hopefully a more sustainable option to lithium ion batteries and, and cheaper option as well. And there we're looking at uh, developing electrolytes, uh, safer electrolytes. So for example, here we, we looked at, um, uh, this is TEP, so it's uh, triethyl phosphate and uh, NABOB, sodium bisoxalate borate. Uh, so this is a, an example of a fluorine-free flame retardant electrolyte, uh, which compared with the commercial uh, kind of uh, flammable and quite heavy on the on the fluorine uh, content, uh, then it's it's quite promising. Uh, in these batteries, then we used hard carbon as an anode, so it's a bit uh, like uh, graphite almost, and uh, Prussian white as a cathode, and. Um, we get quite a, a, a decent sort of capacity after a thousand cycles, quite quite stable. Uh, and we can look at what's happening at the surface of the of the hard carbon here using uh, Hexbest and, and different photon energies uh, are up here. So we see in the orange, this is the substrate, the hard carbon uh, signal, which you see is going up and down relative to the other peaks, which are for the for the SCI surface layer in, in blue and pink. Uh, so we get quite a thick SEI layer on the hard carbon after the first charge. So that's, yeah, this one here. Uh, so we hardly see any of the, the hard carbon peak appearing. Uh, but then it, uh, it, you know, it's fluctuating a little bit. The SEI breathes, it, 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 it dissolves and reforms quite a lot. So, uh, but then after, after the first cycle and up to the 80, 80 cycles, it's quite, quite stable. Uh, then we... Um, uh, we tried this actually on a more sort of commercial level with higher mass loadings on the electrodes, and we found that the, there's quite a rapid failure uh, of, of those kind of uh, batteries. So the solution was then to try different uh, electrolyte additives. So you see a few here, which uh, are then actually in increasing the performance of, of the battery, which was quite nice. We also used uh, XPS then, then to study what, what is going on with these electrolyte additives. Uh, what, what do they do to help the performance? Uh, which I'm not going to go into. Um, but a little bit about our current research, then uh, my group is quite interested in looking at the effect of the substrate and the surface chemistry on the SEI formation and the growth uh, mechanisms. Uh, we're also looking at quite uh, novel electrolytes for lithium and sodium ion batteries, so these non-flammable, fluorine-free organic electrolytes. Uh, and then we're also trying to develop strategies to enable such electrolytes. So, for example, using uh, SCI forming additives or artificial SCI uh, layers as well. And we have a lot of fun at our Hexbus beam, uh, beam sites.
uh, finally, then, um, uh, we have work going on in Uppsala uh, with ambient pressure XPS. So this is uh, towards operando XPS on, on battery systems. So you see here, we can actually build a whole battery cell inside the spectrometer uh, and, and, and run some uh, XPS experiments here. Um, and this is typically done at the Hippie beam line at Max4 in Sweden. And this is very nicely set up uh, to be able to do so. Um, though there are other techniques, of course, uh, to develop some kind of operando uh, uh, yeah, XPS on batteries. So for example, you can build a solid state uh, battery under ultra vacuum. You can use ionic liquids instead of these volatile uh, organic electrolytes. And you can also build uh, liquid cells with an ultra thin membrane, which is still possible to use with uh, a hacks with hacks per setup. Um, and these are things that are being you know uh, developed in various groups. It's very interesting. So I'd like to wrap up. And so in summary, I'd like to uh, say that hopefully I've shown you something about the interfaces in batteries and how they can really define the performance of a battery, uh, and that they're very important to understand. Uh, Hackspes and its related technique can tell us about uh, the comp charge compensation in electrodes, uh, how the electrolyte decomposes to form the SEI surface layer, and we can use it to find out SEI properties uh, when we're aging a battery, so to find out why a battery might fail. Uh, however, there are many challenges, as I mentioned, uh, to, st to study uh, the battery surface. And, uh, however, we have many opportunities to use Hackspace in-house as well as the Tinkertron facilities. Uh, I would say it's quite interesting to use Hackspace for any kind of battery. Uh, it's, it's often at the surfaces where we see these kind of aging mechanisms uh, develop. Uh, but especially when we're using or developing new materials for electrodes and electrolytes, then it's really interesting to see what the differences are um, there. And uh, I would like to acknowledge a few of my co-workers who have uh, contributed to these uh, examples I've shown and some of the funding. And I thank you for your attention.